feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. But it's a- Welcome back to another episode of The Shrimp Tank, coming to you virtually from Seattle, the Pacific Northwest, and again today from the Great White North. Listen, if you want to learn how to start, grow, or run a successful business, this right here, it's the podcast for you. This is where we say street smarts and book smarts collide. Uh, It's the only good place where some sort of collision actually makes sense. Hello again, everyone. I'm Dan Whedon. My co-host today is Phil Simchich from Canada, from Saskatchewan. Welcome, Phil. Our guest today is Dan Ryan, president of Tim Ryan Construction. Uh, I've known Dan for, I think, somewhere around 20 years. He is a second-generation family-owned business of a 65-year-old construction company based in Paulsbo, Washington. His father, Tim, started it back in 1957. Dan and two of his siblings are running the company today. Tim Ryan Construction is a leader in developing commercial properties and providing quality, cost-effective construction. The company has completed a variety of construction projects ranging from commercial office buildings and high-tech medical facilities to restaurants, financial institutions, and a variety of retail buildings. We're going to talk to Dan today about the state of commercial construction and about running a true entrepreneurial family business. Dan, welcome. We'll be with you in just a little bit. Everyone, Thanks. you can find us wherever you're, you get your podcasts. We're on iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and YouTube. Uh, we like to say we are ubiquitous. We come to you from about a dozen cities, including the mothership in Atlanta, Boston, Boca Raton, Charleston. Uh, let's see, we've got Knoxville. We've got Columbus. We've got a whole bunch. In fact, I think we have one coming in Dallas. Uh, we kind of like ours the best. <laughs> Before we bring on Dan, uh, Phil and I need to chat a little bit. How you doing, Phil? Great, Dan. How are you? Uh, doing well, doing well. You know, I was preparing for this. Like I said, I've known Dan Ryan, I think it's beyond 20 years. Uh, uh, good friend, good client, uh, great guy. And uh, I started thinking about family business. Family business, we're going to be talking about that. And I don't know if everybody has heard your family business story that really propelled Phil Simchich into the world of, of business and consulting. And I just thought this would be kind of fun to, uh, to re-engage with that. So Phil, tell us a little bit about your history of family business. Yeah, it's interesting as we see interest rates creep up to maybe 3%. So when I was a teenager, my parents, so my dad was a civil servant draftsman of the highways department. My mom was a homemaker and my aunt and uncle. So my uncle was a principal and my aunt was a teacher. So three of the four civil servants. And they decided they wanted to buy a business someplace to hang out in the summer because they had mostly summers off. So they looked at at, um, a little laundromat and it had good cash flow, but it didn't have room for two families with six kids to stay. And then they found a hotel with lots of rooms. So it was about 22 rooms, sort of like the Bob Newhart um, Lodge from the old days, only we didn't have a restaurant thing. Goodness, we didn't need that yet. And they took the financial statements to an accountant and he said, don't buy the business, doesn't make any money. So of course they bought the business. Interest rates were 23%. So almost a quarter of the cash flow, like it was just crazy. So they mortgaged everything, good credit back then. Banker didn't give them any advice. They ignored the accountant. And so away we went and the accountant was right. We didn't make any money. So when you're not making any money, there's lots of stress. There's no money for food. So we're eating a lot of beans that causes its own set of problems in a house of boys. And that traumatic stress led me to go into first CPA and then consulting so I could help other private companies, family, small, medium businesses to grow, make more money, eat fewer beans and and really some build some business wealth and run their businesses professionally. So that's my background as to why I got into consulting and, and working with family businesses and really looking forward to today's call with Dan Ryan and hearing about his second generation. Congratulations on 65 years in business. That's a very significant accomplishment. So Phil, before I go to Dan, 
I just got to ask, is a 23%, is that Canadian or US? Do we have to do some conversion here of any type? Yeah, well, on a hundred bucks of debt, you'd pay $23 of interest in that year in any country, anywhere around. All right. The world. I was trying to get a little bit of humor in there, but uh, anyway, let's, let's forget about the shenanigans. Let's go on to Dan Ryan. Dan, welcome. Uh, I finally got you on the show. We've had your daughter, Elena, mm -hmm. on twice. We've had your nephew, Peter Crabtree, on. Now we finally, uh, finally have lured you in. And I just I want to ask just to, uh, to, to get started, kind of going off of Phil's story. Uh, I know you are not 65 years old, so you literally were born into a family business. Uh, I'm curious as to your earliest memories of the construction company, of your dad working, of you working. Uh, what are some of your earliest memories of Tim Ryan Construction? Uh, probably the earliest is I can remember. Uh, I couldn't have been maybe five years old or something and and turned out at the time to be our, our family house because dad, after he got started and started getting into spec housing, it was build it, live in it till you could sell it and then move into the next, you know, kind of kind of thing to work up. So um, this particular house didn't have the uh, built in oven in yet. And there's a there's a shot mom and dad had of you know, sitting in the hole where the oven goes or something as a kid. And, and I still remember that kitchen and everything about it, you know, so it's, it's funny what sticks in your head, but, but yeah, I mean, going through school and everything, it was, you know, vacation there, spring break, that, that was working. Um, <laughs> you go help out somewhere. Um, that's just what you did. And, and uh, so I, I always enjoyed it and, um, you know, didn't, didn't really think of anything else that, um, career wise at one point, I think I, I was intrigued with veterinary medicine and that lasted about a year, I think, and, and moved on and my brother ended up becoming a vet. So, um, but, uh, yeah, I got out of high school went into construction management and have been in this field ever since. So one of the, one of the odd ducks. And so second generation family business with siblings, what was the transition like from the first generation, uh, realizing Machiavelli says that power is seized, not given? <laughs> um, it, was, it was a bit of both. Um, you know, dad, dad kind of laid it out. It was, it was interesting. When I went through college and, and graduated, I, I worked for a large national general contractor in Colorado eventually moved out to California and worked out there for a while and found our way back as our kids were starting to get into school age. And we kind of were making that debate. Do we continue the course here? We enjoyed the company and uh, long-term profit sharing all those things looked good, but we were in Southern California and we we're spending all our time coming back to try to visit, you know, siblings, and, uh, cousins, get time with them. And, and it just seemed like you know, Paul's Bow is a pretty nice place to raise a family. So we decided to make the jump and do that. So you may have not realized it at the time, but getting industry experience, ideally at another and often larger company is a great success factor for family business. Was that intentional then, or did you just get drawn back, like you said, due to the, the family and, and, and the lifestyle? Well, it depends who you ask. So, so yes, it was intentional on my part. Um, but I, I played golf with my dad down in the desert a week ago. And as he introduced me to, you know, some of his buddies, he'd always introduce me as, yeah, I told Dan he needed to go work for another contractor before he came back to work for me. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, that was, that was my hope is to, to broaden the spectrum and, and see what's out there. And um, kind of interestingly, when, so it was 83 time frame when I was graduating college, which the economy was in pretty tough straits then with interest rates and everything. So there wasn't a huge demand for um, people being hired into construction. So I think I was one of one of two out of our graduating class that had a job when when we turned the tassels on our hats. Um, and I went down for an interview with a company that I'd been trying for six months to interview with. And they just called me up out of the blue and said, come on down. And what they did is they they kind of round robin a bunch of kids from all over the country and at the same time and went around to different project managers in the company and VPs and they all interviewed us and then sent us on our way and, and made some choices. So 
I go into, you know, probably the third or fourth guy and he's got his feet up on his desk. He's got a cigar in his hand and my resume and he throws the resume on the desk and goes, I told him I didn't even want to talk to anybody about a father in construction. And I just, well, what do you want to talk about? I'm here. <laughs> so, so there is that, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a problem and a solution to that. So, you know, if, if you say no to that kid coming through the door, that might turn out to be your future president of the company, or it could like in our case, turn out to be the president of someone else's company someday, but um, no different than any other hire, I guess, but there, it, it's definitely worth getting that experience in and seeing what the other, the other group does. So. So Dan, uh, I, I'm not exactly sure when this transition took place, but in your story about growing up, you talked about spec houses and, and your dad building, uh, obviously residential houses. You are primarily a, a commercial contractor today. When and how did that transition start happening? Uh, they, in the probably early 70s, well, yeah, early 70s, they bought a beach house in Kingston. And I can remember during the summer, we'd move over for that. And dad would still work on the other side and take the ferry and he'd ride his bike across and, and uh, commute every day. And so as he was starting to do that, um, you start realizing that the, one of the problems with residential construction is the clients always want to meet on the weekend or after hours because they're working. So they expect that you're going to, you're going to fill in in their bad time. Right. Um, so now he's commuting and doing that. And just, I think he got to the realization that this is just nuts, um, really wanted to get into more commercial stuff. Um, so they moved over. Of course, the problem was now he's the new guy in town. And so he's got to find work somewhere and, and really work toward that into the commercial. But that was, that was the goal at that time was to try to get into more commercial things. So when we came, I came back up, um, that was my push too. That's all I had really known was the commercial side. Um, so that was continued to be my push into that realm. And, and we just kind of kept that moving that way. So let's talk a little bit more about what did your dad do to get commercial business when he was the new guy on the block? Because people aren't, even if he's got the lowest price, right? People are still going to be leery. So how did he, how did he overcome those obstacles? It was really the same same hustle he started with um, when he started the company. It was you know he was ROTC. Um, they sent him off to boot camp. Um, Korean War was over. They had more officers than they needed, so he was in and out in a heartbeat. And and all of a sudden he's like, okay, well I'm out of I'm out of the army. Um, I got a wife who's pregnant, and I need a job. So I thought, well I'll go back and knock on the door of the contractor I worked with while I was going to college and they said yeah great it's November and we're not building anything you know check back in the spring we might be happy and he's like well but you know I got I got mouths to feed I got to do something and so he just started hustling any kind of insurance work he could or anything um, literally took the family car put a ski rack on the top of it to bolt lumber to and ended up getting like a one-wheel trailer that you bolt onto the bumper and that's how he hauled hauled stuff and then Sunday come around, you know, they'd take all the stuff off the car so they could go to church. Um, <laughs> so when it, when it was over here, it was kind of back to that same hustle of you just go out there and knock on doors and, and find things. And, and he'd do, I, I remember one he did up in uh, the town of Concrete, which is up in the mountains and uh, uh, quite a distance away. So he'd stay, I think, three or four days a week there and, and work you know 10 12 hour days up there with a the crew and then come back um but he'd do any hustle and in that case he got intrigued with cattle and you know started doing some literally horse trading with cows for payment you know i'll take a bread heifer in exchange plus some cash on that deal and so whatever whatever worked um he he just chased it um and his personality was such he could he could make those connections and and move along so well, we've come to a point that we've got to make some connections as well. We have to pay the bills, Dan. And, and to do that, we're going to take a short break to hear from today's Spotlight sponsor. And when we come back with our guest, Dan Ryan, for our Hot or Not section of the show, 
uh, we're going to find out which smarts he thinks are the most important. Don't walk away. We'll be right back with more of the Shrimp Tank. Would you like to grow your business, increase revenues, and raise profits? Would more financing from your banker help you grow? Who is guiding your succession plan? Would you like more control over your business so you can sleep better at night? SME Business Wealth Builder works with business leaders and owners like you to help them grow their business and build their business wealth. For more information and to check out free resources, go to smewealthbuilder.com. All right, welcome back to the Shrimp Tank, where we interview the best and brightest CEOs and business thought leaders in the greater Puget Sound area and beyond. I'm Phil Simchich, and our guest today is Dan Ryan. And for our next segment, Hot or Not. So Dan, this is where Phil and I are going to pepper you with questions about business, about life, maybe even about some football, who knows. Uh, and you're going to tell us whether uh, our question or our topic is hot or not and why or why not. Uh, you know, you're, you mentioned uh, your, your dad, Tim, who I know very well and have played a little bit of golf with, uh, with as well. And uh, Tim is a hustler, man. He gets out and he, he, uh, he epitomized and still does street smarts. But I'm just going to ask you, uh, which one's hotter, street smarts or book smarts? Uh, street smarts, clearly. Yeah. Can you can you expound on that? Tell us why. Well, I, I know a lot of people who are very book smart, but uh, day to day, I just relationships, all those kind of things become difficult. So um, this isn't to discount knowledge. You've got to have that too, but um, you got to be able to understand personalities and, and adjust based on what you run into uh, and be flexible. And if all you know is the process, um, that'll only get you so far. Uh, so Dan, supporting your community and, and giving back, hot or not? Uh, hot. Um, our, our attitude's always been that, you know, we're in this community, our, our staff is from the community. And so whether it's a little league team that we've got staff that have kids going or, or a client um, who's, who's doing those type of things. Um, we always, we always circle back. And if they hired us for a job, we're more than happy to help them back too, because it, it goes full circle. So. And, and by the way, I'll just say that uh, Tim Ryan construction and Dan and Mary have done an incredible job with that. I mean, you, every, everything around uh, the community has, has a mark, uh, from them, I, I know that. Uh, so hot or not, though, speaking of money, I guess, uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you a true or false instead of hot or not. True or false, your banker is your best friend in business. <laughs> uh, we, we he may or, he or she may or may not we be. We have listening. a lot of bankers know. we work for, but <laughs> 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 it is an important piece, but you know, uh, when when the going gets tough, um, you need a good banker. Um, but I, I'll say a good banker is tougher to find these days. And, and at the end of the day, uh, I think we learned that lesson in the downturns. Um, you know, they've got to protect themselves, too. And so um, if you think they're your best friend, they're ultimately going to come down to they got to they got to look out for their assets, too. So, um, yes, you need them. Um, yes, you have to have a good relationship. Um, but you got to look out for yourself. So. Um, so you had good industry experience working for other and bigger companies and then came back to the family business. So the question for you would be after your children got industry experience, would you bring them back into the business hot or not? Uh, definitely would. Yeah. And, and it doesn't even have to be necessarily in the same line of work. Um, it's get life experience out there, understand how the real world works. And, and you know, I, I got a degree in construction management and it, it's a great, a great program where you get business, um, you get, you know, physics, you get architecture, you get structural, um, civil engineering, they meld it together in a great way. Um, but I tell people often, I, I could have just forgotten all of that, learned that, um, I should have taken nothing but human resources and psychology, um, and that would have served me probably better than anything. So, 
You know, it's funny you say that, Dan, because, uh, you know, I, I was a history major in college because I liked history. I didn't know what, what else to do. But if I had to do that over again, just knowing what my line of, I would have taken psychology. I, I would have, I would have majored in that because I think uh, that that plays a, a major part in it. I want to deviate from hot or not for just a second. I was thinking of just when you came into the business, when you, when you left the company you're working for, joined your dad, uh, and, and just knowing the big personality your dad is and the footprint that he, he left in the county, uh, I got to believe that there was a period of time where it was, it was, it was kind of hard. I mean, you were Tim's kid, right? Uh, as, as opposed to Dan Ryan, who'd eventually be president of the organization. H how, how tough was that? And, and how long did it take, even after Tim started stepping away to, to, to really, hey, th I'm running this business? Yeah, I, I can't remember the timing of it, but it was it was fairly quick. I want to say within probably a three year period that we made the made the transition. He was he was pretty certain how he wanted to to carve it up, and and so some of that decision work was done, and just said this is the way I want to break the business up as far as ownership. Um, the harder thing is, yeah, how do you how do you wean Tim and his personality out? It's his company, and and. So I, I still remember a day where I, where I drove down to his house and met him after work and just kind of had a, a, a heart to heart with him. And it, I can't remember what it was, but it basically the, the tendency was, um, you know, running a job, he might come through the job and, and the guys naturally would ask questions or something. And he'd say, well, geez, you know, I do this or I do that. Why aren't you doing that? Didn't really know the project or the details, but he mention that. So naturally the guys then would all of a sudden go, well, geez, Tim said, um, so I did it another way. And I came back, back in after the fact, and it wasn't done the way I had laid it out. So we had a discussion on that, that, you know, <laughs> I, I appreciate you coming through, but next time when somebody asks, it's okay to say, I don't know, um, let me check with Dan, but it seems odd to me, or, you know, I, I think it would be done a different way rather than just say, well, why are you doing it that way? Uh, you should do it this way. Um, and that was, I think, the turn moment right there of when he kind of realized, okay, I got I to gotta be more careful on how I step and, and really didn't have any issues after that point. But um, it was a, was a reminder. And, and I remember that still now when I'm there too and going through the jobs and it's same, same kind of response and the superintendent project manager running the job and I come through to check on things. Um, I'm very careful to always say, hey, <laughs> you, you might want to check back with the guys on this, but this doesn't look right, you know, but I don't know the details or what they gave you, um, but go back and check this out with your superintendent and make sure you're good. But So from a family business perspective, what are the top two or three lessons that you learned probably the hard way and it took some emotional fortitude to um, took it to cross, just like you, you mentioned. So you're giving advice to another family business, first or second generation, looking at transitioning. What are the top two or three things they really have to get right? Well, I think, I think, you know, we had the benefit of, of kind of having a clear structure laid out. And I think the three of us kind of fell in line with what that was. Um, I don't recall any big angst over, you know, why you, why not me, um, those type of things. Um, so I think I think that's probably the number one is is make sure that there's a defined structure. Doesn't mean it can't change, but you know set that up and get consensus or dictate consensus that this is this is the way it is because I was the founder and this is the way I see it from my perspective. Um, and now it's up to you know us in our case to to earn that that. Um, association of, of roles. Um, and, and I think for the most part, we did pretty good. And um, you're still going to have, you know, the typical sibling issues that you have where, you know, why me, why not you um, pop up occasionally that, you know, brothers are the, the worst fighters, right? Um, and, and we had a period of that too, where we, you know, have a conflict or something. And it's like, Jesus, okay, get over that. And um, we moved on from that a long time ago. And um, everybody knows their roles. And um, but I think, I think that hierarchy setting it up and agreeing that's the way it is, um, is good. If you don't, I think you're going to be fighting that all the way through. So, 
you, you know, I, I, I want to bring up just really quickly the, 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 the whole, you, you have your brother, uh, Kevin is, is with you at, at Tim Ryan construction, your sister, Colleen, but it just feels like everybody who has any Tim Ryan blood in is an entrepreneur of some sort. Uh, you, you, you know, all the way up and down, I'm talking uh, grandchildren and great grandchildren. It seems that it's a family of entrepreneurs. Uh, do you think that that's just kind of baked into the family? Uh, I mean, because it's just, it seems that everybody uh, who comes out of, of, you know, your large family tree finds a way to create their own thing. Do you think that that's just part of how, you know, maybe some families operate, that that's just kind of the given? Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, certainly you could argue there's, there's a genetic anomaly in that. Um, it creates the, the audacity to want to go out on your own and hang your shingle out. Um, but I think a lot of it's probably just been exposed to it, right? Yeah. You've been exposed to the possible. Um, so some kid growing up that's never been exposed to that possible, how could they imagine that they could go out on their own? You, you should be working for the man for your life because that's what your father and my father before me did, right. um, that type of thing. So. I love that exposed to the possible. I don't know if I've ever heard it put that way. I really, I really like that. Um, learning from mistakes, hot or not? Uh, totally hot. Yeah. Um, you know, preach with with the the crew we have coming through now because we've got kind of a younger project management superintendent bunch that's working their way up now, and and the the tendency is always. You know, I'm going to charge and I'm going to solve this problem and, and I'm trying to let them do that. But at the same time, remember that there's a whole brain trust behind here, um, probably been there, done that or done something similar. So charge ahead, come with good ideas, but, but work as a team and, and vet the idea, you know, lay the problem out with the team and go, Hey, this is what I'm up against. This is what I'm thinking. Anybody see any issues here, or, you know, been there, done that before. Uh, rather than just be the bleeding edge all the time and finding out that that didn't work out so well. Um, yeah, so definitely huge, huge learning opportunity there. You know, Dan, the construction industry uh, certainly has never lacked for volatility at different, <laughs> at different periods. It can, uh, you know, maybe commercial construction is a, a little bit uh, different in that regard than, than residential. But you know, if we're talking about the state of construction, uh, what do you what do you like the most about where that is, and what do you like the least? Uh, like like the most that it. I mean, we got extra odd times now with all the COVID impacts and supply chain um, from a cycle point of view because it is a repeating cycle. Um, we're clearly at the top of that cycle um, as interest rates tighten up. Um, that's going to put a slam on construction. Um, and then you cope, uh, marry that up with a supply chain that's just driven up building material prices and, and labor rates. Um, I think it's going to be kind of a, a sharp halt. Um, uh, that's, that's what I don't like. Um, and, and thinking back, you know, cyclical. So again, we started the company in 57. And I remember, I think it was 62 when um, you know the billboards in Seattle were the last one out of Seattle, turn out the lights, um, and Dad was you know building spec houses at that time in Somerset. And anybody knows where Somerset is? It's just below Newcastle Golf Course, um, and it's a pretty pricey area right now. And at the time, Dad was selling I think you know a complete house for about forty thousand um, <laughs> dollars. So so things move on, cycles change, but. That was a that was a low point, and things things change quick. Um, I can usually tell when, you know, you you're at the top of the cycle when, you know, the drywaller says, "Yeah, I'm doing spec houses because man, they're easy to make money on, right?" Um, everybody thinks it's it's easy peasy to do these things, and and that's when the brakes usually slam and and we fall off the backside. So, you know, the guys are busy, busy, busy working on current inventory and and backlog. And, and I'm out ahead going, okay, and what's out six months? What's out a year? Um, how are we going to position ourselves on the, on the slide down and be in a, a good spot to weather through all that again? So 
So before, yeah, before we head to break, I have a real quick, real quick follow up on that. Uh, is commercial construction a little bit more immune than, than residential from a volatility standpoint? Have you have you found that to be true, or is that wrong? Uh, it is, and it's it's dependent again on area. So in Kitsap County, we're in a gray area because um, the housing demand is built up so much. The commercial responds to the residential. So as Kitsap's growing, um, it just puts more pressure on more dentists, doctors, lawyers, um, places to shop, places to eat. Um, so, so we're in a really good geographic area for that. Um, but at the end of the day, somebody to do a project still has to get financing. And so that becomes the biggest hindrance to, to progress on things is can you get it financed? Well, what we have to get financed, I guess, somehow or other, is our take care of our sponsors. We're going to take our second short break to hear from our sponsors. And when we come back with our guest, Dan Ryan, for our famous Plead the Fifth section of the show, uh, we're going to be talking some football. Don't walk away. We'll be right back with more of the Shrimp Tank. Plead the Fifth is brought to you by our corporate sponsors. Ideal Life 360, Cornerstone Financial. First Underwriters Insurance, Kitsap Sun Newspaper, BC Fitness Studio, and the Upstart Group. Please visit our website at www.shrimptankpodcast.com forward slash Seattle to learn more about these terrific companies. Now, back to the show. Welcome back to the Shrimp Tank, where we interview the best and brightest CEOs and business thought leaders in the greater Puget Sound area and beyond. I'm co-host Phil Simchich, and our guest this week is Dan Ryan. For our next segment, Plead the Fifth. So, Dan, this is where we pepper you with uh, questions, uh, maybe turning up the heat just a little bit. You get to plead the fifth, but only get to plead the fifth once. I don't know if you have an attorney in your in the in the Ryan. I think you do. I think you. I don't know. Uh, but if you do, you, you you can only call them once. So what people don't uh, know maybe is that Dan and I are rivals on the college football scene. Uh, Dan is a Washington State University Cougar. I'm a University of Washington Husky. However, we share share the same uh, loyalty for the pro team, the Seattle Seahawks. So Dan, uh, plead the fifth. Which would you rather? the Seahawks win another Super Bowl or the Washington State Cougars win a Rose Bowl? Uh, clearly, Cougs win in a Rose Bowl. Oh, that, that, that supplants uh, probably because the yeah. Cougs have never won one. Is that correct? <laughs> well, it, <laughs> it's certainly time. At time, yeah. So uh, I, was just, I was curious, which one would... Uh, so clearly the Cougs winning a Rose Bowl is... is uh, and it might be closer than the Seahawks winning a Super Bowl now. We never know. But uh... yeah. so I had the benefit of going to two Super Bowls with the Seahawks. So it was awesome to go with my kids. So um, I'm I'm content there. And we need the Rose Bowl trip. And 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 those were not the two losses. You got one loss, but I think you got one of the wins too, didn't you? Correct. Yeah. There you go. You got the Denver and the Pittsburgh. There you go. So Dan, you've been asked to speak to a group of high school students. What would you tell them? Uh, I think I think a little bit of what we alluded to already, which is, you know, don't be afraid to take a chance um, and explore, um, get experience and don't feel like you're in a lane, um, whether that's, you know, a lane to have to go to college or have to be in the trades. Um, it's OK to start one direction, go another. Um, it's all good. Get out there and just get life experiences and and you can apply all of that to any work that you do. So. So I number some normally we ask about maybe uh, who would you rather have dinner with, but you and I are both golfers, so let's do this. You, you get to play golf with three people, dead or alive, uh, and you get to play around and, and you get to talk to them. Who would those three people? Who would you choose? Oh man, um, well, you got to go with Tiger. Okay, got to go with Jack. And I don't know somebody uh, maybe like Lee Torvino. Um, okay. Need, a, need an old school, just yeah, character type, you know. Yeah, that Lee Trevino was an, indeed a character. Uh, yeah. yeah, that those, those are great answers. I like all three. So after the housing and economic crash of two thousand and eight, how did you 
maneuver Tim Ryan construction through those difficult times? Well, we we kind of tried to keep the focus on I've never I've never been a running the business from a point of you know year over year growth was the mandate. Um, with us, it was get our market share. And if the market drops, um, we still get our share of the market. And, and so just keep doing what we do. And with that, we'll weather through the storm and we'll be ready and in place when the market ramps back up um, rather than shedding personnel and those type of things. We try to keep them, keep them all busy doing something so that we could be there on the turn up. So Dan, I know you you're you're busy doing uh, Tim Ryan construction work, but let's let's just say I, I I tell you you have to start a new business. You gotta you gotta ditch the construction. You gotta start a new business. I know you probably figure out how to do that easily, but you gotta base it on a hobby. What's the hobby that you would start a new business with? Well, a couple of years ago, I got a got a boat finally, so um, something to keep me busy and occupied on something totally different than I've been doing my whole career. Um, so I'd say, yeah, probably uh, be a, you know, a fishing guide or something like that, where I could be, You'd out be on a, a skipper. Would you be a skipper? Yeah. Uh, there I, we go. <laughs> Cap and Dan. <laughs> Grimping expeditions, right? There you go. So who in your life has been most influential in your career and business development process? Um, I'd, I'd have to say my father, you know, really, he's, um, guided me back. Um, he, he had a totally different path. So he was, he was a business major. Um, so that's the side he knew. Um, I went in the whole construction side and, and got that experience for 10 years outside on bigger stuff. But, um, we still had, I think, a common vision and understanding of each other, um, and, and he did a great job of, of mentoring me along instead of, you know, hovering over and mandating. It was give me, give me leash to, to do what I needed to do, but um, would give it a tug every once in a while when he'd have worry about a hanging. So, um. so you know, uh, it's it said that sometimes, Dan, we can be our own worst uh, critics. And uh, all of us that even, even, when you've been in business for as long as as uh, Tim Ryan Construction has, we we all have our our some level crises of confidence at times. What's an area that you, even at this point, still might might struggle with, and somebody listening can say, "Oh, I, I can learn from that." I think I think for me, it's like I said, I I I tend to focus forward and beyond. Um, you know what's coming around the corner next, and and you know it's it's probably gratitude and being in the moment with those that are working today. Right. Cause I'm, I'm so driven that I, you know, but we got to get the next thing and it's, it's great. You did that, but that was your job. Right. I mean, you're supposed to do that, but <laughs> did you do something extraordinary? I, I got, you got my attention, but um, so it's, it's giving employees that, that gratitude that I, I feel, uh, but don't express enough because I'm so focused on, that next alligator that's going to jump up and, and trying to get the next table set so we can move on to the next job. And, and so I have, a, I have to consciously work toward that to, to really let them know that they're, they are appreciated and, and where we're going. So. so what advice would you have for a CEO that's too much in the here and now and not enough into the future? Um, I think, I think really that's the scariest thing. I think I think that's the trap everybody falls into when when times are good. It's so easy, um, and we see that all the time um, in our business. We got we got a lack of tradesmen right now because they're all doing side jobs. Um, you know, you don't have to work for somebody. Everybody can go out on their own and just do decks or whatever. So we're trying to find seasoned carpenters, but they're getting cash projects that they're plentiful, right? So it's easy. And then all of a sudden the economy flips and now they're going to be back knocking on the door and they're going, well, we don't have work now because the economy shut down. Um, we're keeping our core crew busy, right? Um, and you can apply that, that same mentality to kind of everything where if you're living in the here and now and not setting up for what's coming around the corner, whether that's financing and getting financing in place, early. So when rates change, you're ready to go. 
um, whether it's seeing what your workload's coming ahead of you so you can adjust your, your personnel today to be ready for that. Um, all of those kind of opportunities are there. Technology, um, technology trend, how do you keep ahead of the game there instead of just chasing tail and you know, going into COVID, uh, how many were looking for a, a camera for their PC, right? I mean, <laughs> you couldn't find one anywhere, right? Because, well, if you had kind of thought through some of that before and said, hey, this is where, where we're moving toward this area, um, I think more people would have been prepared for that. And, and there's just hundreds of those kind of examples of just not being ready for the next thing that's going to drop. Well, Phil, I think this is the time where uh, we've got to actually ask Dan for uh, some some follow up information and uh, for people who want to hear from him. <laughs> that's <laughs> fascinating that's... <laughs> conversation, Dan. You, you got to write a book. Like, there's just so much business <laughs> advice here. I'm just sitting here like a student taking notes. This is awesome. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Dan, thank you so much for being a guest with us here today on the Shrimp Tank. For our listeners that want to get in touch with you or learn more about your company, how can they get more information? Uh, best source is probably our website with the contact information there. So, Okay, awesome. And we'll stream that right in, into the, the video. So everyone, make sure you check out all the replays on shrimptankpodcast.com slash Seattle. And wherever you get your podcasts, such as iHeart, Apple, or Google, Spotify, uh, please follow us on our show's social media pages, uh, such as YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Well, Dan, it has I, I'm, it's been a pleasure. I'm so glad that we we finally got you on. I'm looking forward to uh, to getting out on the golf course with you a little bit more this year. Thank and uh, as the weather turns better. So thanks. Thanks for joining us today. Phil, as always, thank you. Uh, appreciate you coming across the border and helping out. Everybody do exactly what Phil said. Uh, make sure that you like us on our Facebook page because that's where we live stream every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Pacific time. Join us for lunch. Our next show will be Wednesday, April the 27th. Our guest will be Russell Benaroya with Stride Services. Michelle Baumberger will be joining me for that show. In the meantime, please, though, be safe, be well, and be prosperous, because until next week, the shrimp is back in the tank. So long. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank.